welcome everybody to a new episode of the Art Business Podcast. Um, this week, my guest is Michaela Milikori, um, and her main subject of interest for us in the art business is uh, she's an art advisor. If I think back, I don't think there's been an art advisor on this podcast. Um, I've only been running it for about a year, uh, but obviously this is a subject which I think a lot of listeners will be very interested in knowing more about. Obviously, there are issues of confidentiality when it comes to speaking about clients, so we can't name any names, but uh, I think Michaela will have some quite interesting stories and anecdotes um, that, that, that she'll be able to put across to us anyway. Um, so welcome, Michaela. Thank you. Thank you for having me and for inviting me. No problem. And well, thank you for being a guest. Uh, and um, just a, a brief background, and I will I will post, I'll ask Michaela to send me a, a, a brief bio and uh, and be posting that on, on the um, site. Uh, but uh, so, so Michaela has been an art advisor since 2016. So she's got over five years experience under her belt, as it were. Academically, um, she studied for a master's degree in art history at the esteemed University College London Art History Department. And uh, she's currently completing a PhD in art business and management at Royal Holloway uh, at the University of London in their School of Business Management and in the Department of Marketing. Uh, specifically, I think I think Michaela's expecting to submit her dissertation um, later in the summer, so we look forward to to that. Um, uh, so, Michaela, I'm going to just start in the normal way. Favorite city? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my favorite city. Um, well, anyone who knows me knows that. So, <laughs> uh, my favorite city is Venice. Uh, Venice. Venice, Italy. Yeah. Um, would you like to know why? <laughs> Well, I, I I can't say I'm surprised. I mean, it's well, it's it's possibly a candidate for my favorite city, for obvious yeah, reasons. But um, you tell tell me why why it's yours. Well, obviously, the obvious reason is like it's, it's so different to well all the other cities in the world, and at the same time, it's such a big art hub. Um, and I just I guess it's you know this plays a big part of it. At the same time, I think I consider Venice, although I'm not Italian, I consider Venice to be my first art home. Um, it was where I got my first internship, my first part-time job as well. Um, and then I just I just keep returning back every year. Um, I just make sure that I visit every year. Um, yeah, I first worked at the Venice Biennale about 10 years ago. And that's what really, you know, kind of, created that spark in me and that passion for art absolutely and on top of all that of course it's the most beautiful unusual city and setting um and um just to just to give some more detail on what Michaela's just said for the listeners um I think she's been very modest because her internship was at the Peggy Guggenheim <laughs> Museum yeah I also had that but yeah my first art job was um at the Venice Biennale and I was like um an exhibition guide and I was a, a pavilion um, assistant for the pavilion of Lithuania and Cyprus um, that was 10 years ago um, in the I think the 55th edition of Biennale at the time. Can you um, remember the name of the edition you know they have names I'm just trying to think back what that mm -hmm. might be don't worry if you can't I, I honestly can't remember it, but they do have <laughs> names. We, we, I should know because I think we were going there about 10 years ago. We started with the MA Art Business at Sotheby's Institute of Art. Uh, we we take people to Venice to every art biennale where we learn more about the kind of logistics and business from them. Um, you know, the, we, obviously we go to the art, uh, uh, but but that's our primary interest because of our, our programme. Um, and we we then started going to the architectural biennale to make sure that that's every other year and to make sure that students weren't missing out on Venice because there's a lot of other things we do uh, on an art business level in Venice mm -hmm. as well. From me taking people around uh, to look at altarpieces in the great churches by Renaissance artists where there are contracts and we can talk about the business of artists, patrons, contracts, then to people obviously visiting the Pino galleries of the... Um, the the Dogana and the the Grassi, which you will know well, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's like it's a very growing art hub. Um, it's as you said, the Pei Greenham Museum that I am an alumni of, um, and then it's the Venice Biennale. Um, the Venice Biennale, you've got art, and then you've got architecture. You also have the cinema one, the cinema one. Yes. Um, 
you have got like the Buddha Dogana and Palazzo Grassi. You also have the Fondazione Prada. Yes. Um, there's so many different things and so many private museums and so many public events, art events that happen. Um, and yeah, it's a it's a great city to include in a in a master's program. Well done. Yeah, well, it, it, it it's good. Um, and and um, the the forgotten what I was going to say now. Oh, what else was I going to say about that? Um, oh, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 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 I guess in some ways the the, the Venice, um, you know, on a, on a, on time off, I often go across the Lido to swim, you know, rent a cabana, a cabin to to swim and relax. And she says, in some ways, you could say it's, and I think there's a nature reserve there as well. Um, and, and in some ways, you could say it's kind of quite a rustic, non-urban location. But do you have a favourite kind of rural rustic location that you like to chill out in sometimes? I really don't. I I come from. You're a, a city girl. I, I, <laughs> no, actually, I come from uh, from you know a country that's, well, I grew up next to the beach, not really next to the beach, but like in an island. Um, and I spend my summers in the beach, so um, hmm. I don't have, I can't have a favorite. Well, which I, which <laughs> island? I, I'm from Cyprus originally. Yes, that's what so, I thought. Uh, I, I was thinking of a little an island, island. <laughs> not a huge island like Cyprus, of course. Yeah. Um, so, and um, I don't know if you have any, are you into architecture? If so, you know, or, or can you think of a building that particularly you particularly love? Oh, building. Um, <laughs> That's put you on the spot, sorry. <laughs> actually, yes, yeah. I mean, I love the, the cathedral and the St. Paul's Cathedral. I, I like old buildings. Um, I like, you know, kind of very symmetrical architecture. Um, yeah. And I think, cool. I guess... That's one of the reasons they're classical. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I like London is because it kind of combines, you know, being a city person, a city girl, and also, you know, kind of being around, you know, the architecture of Mayfair is just, it's just phenomenal for me. I just love walking around Mayfair, walking around all classical buildings in Marleyburn. Um, mm. it's, it's like lovely neighborhoods. And probably that's why I also like Central Europe that much. Um, mm. Because I guess the, class, the classicism, of course, which we got ultimately from ancient Greek buildings yeah. via the Italian versions, the Roman versions, it kind of reminds you of home, perhaps. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> In <laughs> a different conscious, subconscious level, then yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, are you into music? I think most people on this podcast say I'm very eclectic in my musical taste. Are you one of those? No, I am the opposite. I um uh there is many things that i don't like but there is many things i do like uh so i'm not sure which category i fall in um these days i'm just like i am a very pop music person right. <laughs> very extreme yeah. um yeah I, yeah <laughs> i don't know if that's okay. what you're expecting so you in so you kind of like got your airpods in and listening to you know spotify pop music there are other music yeah. platforms <laughs> yeah, yeah that sort of thing yeah, yeah. Probably, I, I love like, probably similar taste to my son then so i get i get a lot of the pop <laughs> music still from 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 his taste because he always insists on putting his music on in the car mm. <laughs> um and um and there's a lot of it i really like um so and and, and the, coming to the obvious question you know maybe you don't I don't know if you've got a favourite work of art. I hate being asked that myself. If you do have something that you'd like to talk about, do. But otherwise, maybe, can you? what are your earliest memories of visual arts? My earliest memories of visual arts? I mean, I actually do have a favourite art book. Oh, right. Well, talk, talk about... Sure, can I... Yeah, talk about that first, yeah. <laughs> can I share this? Um, yeah. Do you know the book called The Value of Art? Sorry, say that again. Um, it's the book called The Value of Art by Matthew Oh, yes, Vincent. yeah, I've got it actually on my bookshelf here. <laughs> yeah, um, it's not an old book. It's actually a really new book. Um, I, I think it's it's relatively new comparing to the amount of books that are out there about art. Um, it's just so beautifully written. And the way that the sections have been um, split into, you know, Given them Greek female names of like Greek mythology, I just find that so appealing because mm. it's 
probably how I think as well. Like I think in threes, I think in names, I need to give names to, to things. My PhD is very much structured, you know, around these ideas. Obviously I'm not stealing anyone's ideas, but um, I just like naming, you know, um, theories and people. And I just love how he, um, um, how the author actually talks about the different aspects of value and how they all need to come together in order to call something valuable. Um, and yeah, and it's about art. I mean, so so it's there. kind of about it's kind of about the. Can you remember the author's name? Because I think I, I've got a book called The Worth of Art. So pardon my ignorance. Can you remember the author's oh, name? Yeah, it's Mark Finchley. Um, Mark I think Finchley. That's how... Yeah. Mm. Okay, just for the listeners, really, in case Finley. they're interested. Sorry, Finley. Finley, Mark Finley. Um, so, so, and this is quite recently published. Um, I I can very very easily look you up if you if you want me to. Yeah, um, well, it doesn't matter. But it sounds as though what he's talking about is is both cultural and, to a certain extent, financial value. Or is it only really about? So it's um the idea is that there's three values of art that kind of interconnect with each other, and mm -hmm. it's the financial the social and yeah. kind of artistic um yeah. and you know they're they're just my <laughs> view of the world is that these are the three the three driving forces of the world <laughs> so that's why it appeals to me like i feel that the world revolves around love money and power social yeah. power so people might disagree. There is like, you know, the Freudians who might think that's also fear of death. That's a driving force. Um, but I think that these are the driving forces. And I think that's why when you put this into the context of art and the value of art and how you understand the value of art, that's why it just is so appealing. And it does it in such a way that's not, it just romanticizes the whole thing, you know, giving it nice names, linking it back to female names talking mm -hmm. about it separating it i just feel like that's that's a really beautiful book and you know you should you should have it in your bookshelf if you don't <laughs> and I, I i've been reading katie hessel's the history of art without men which is uh you know which is another area where not just um not for profit galleries have been revising these particular you know both both old master um, women artists, but also, um, you know, contemporary, emerging contemporary artists, people are now very interested in collecting in the art world, as we'll come on to that, because you, you will know all about that as an art advisor. Um, but um, of course, there's a lot of academic art historians who, who don't think that money should be part of understanding art. And I think maybe that's where you and I might differ from them i don't even see it as a bolt-on personally since i've been teaching art business i think it's always been an integral part of the production and consumption of art from greek antiquity even earlier mm -hmm. i would argue right to the present day i um i find this very interesting because i mean you i think you mentioned already where i graduated art history but um it's very funny because um i feel i was brainwashed during my <laughs> master's into thinking that anything involving galleries, the market, auction houses, private collections should be kind of, you know, it's 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 crime, you know? Like it should be criminalized. <laughs> Oh, that's, and, definitely, uh, that's definitely that's yeah. definitely the driving force, I think, of, of academic, most academic art history departments. What I have noticed is these people in the early millennium when I started as program director of ML Business, these people literally would treat me like dirt the moment I said as at Sotheby's. <laughs> now, now, you know, we we hosted the first Tiamza conference of academic institutions that are studying the history of the art market. Mm -hmm. uh, and they tend to study the history rather than tell their students how to become like we are on my MA, telling them how to work in that world, that there are jobs outside of public galleries. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's changed quite a lot. And I think that we have a lot more to say to one another now. Uh, and I've also noticed that some of the commercial galleries that I've um, done work with uh, are, are increasingly, there are other people being asked to write introductory essays who are from that public sector and, uh, and agreeing to do it. And there was a time when they would not agree to do that. So I think things have changed a lot recently, which I think is great. I, I think you're right. And I think, you know, um... Institutions like the Sotheby's Institute have really contributed in that change because 
you kind of put the art market and the art business in the in, in you know in on the table as a you, you put in the on the on the map as, as something that's worth studying, researching, analyzing, talking about in the educational setting, um, which, you know, has always been very worthy of attention, but it wasn't as common, um, I guess, before these schools were established. Um, and yeah, so, well, obviously to yourself, well done, but also to everybody who kind of contributes to yeah. that. And, and to, to hundreds, thousands of our alumni who've gone into that world, you know, we, we, we spend an awful lot of time teaching ethics and law to make our students very, very aware of those ethical issues. So, so you know, we are preparing them for to try and make them into good people and to, to turn the art world into a into a bet into a more ethical world and obviously yeah. because it involves often high finance that is a often a, seen as a bit of a losing battle um but um you know i think generally speaking we we try to create a bad although we have the sotheby's brand name we're not owned by sotheby's we see ourselves as an objective academic uh, institution and we do try to teach students to be very very balanced and a lot of our students go into the not-for-profit sector fundraising uh sustainability increasingly you know, art journalism, which is often investigative and therefore highly ethical and trying to, uh, you know, pinpoint uh, where there is corruption in the art world. And so, you know, we do we do our bit, I would say. Uh, so um, let's go back to that other question. Um, mm -hmm. How did you get into art? Do you have any early memories, like a kind of Freudian um, question? Well, you know, when I got into art when I was five years old. I just started painting and creating and making art and like everything around art and craft, I just adored. And it was like my my calling, you know, it was my passion. Um, so in my early years, all I wanted to do is become an artist because I was just so in love with the idea of, you know, making more than the actual end product, more than the more than the art itself. I just I just discovered the ideas of like aesthetics and beauty and taste, obviously with not without this kind of theoretical connotations that they have now in my head. But like at the time it was just so amazing doing all these things. So I just decided I wanted to become an artist and uh, an artist and I just took all the steps to study art. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, you know. And, and, and were you from a, an artistic family? No, I really, I mean, I've got people in my life, like my godmother and my dad, who um, know how to draw, like architectural designs, and they were like really crafty. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't really that. Um, I think how it started, and I probably just don't give enough credit. Um, my my auntie just one day decided that you know um, we should start taking art classes because. We're gonna like it. It was like no questions asked. You are gonna like it, and I and I did. I loved it. Um, and I was doing it forever, ever since I remember myself being a child. I honestly don't remember me dreaming or sleeping. I remember me making art. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it was just how interesting. Uh, it was it was such a beautiful thing. I mean, hmm. I guess the reason. Do you, do you continue? Is, sorry, do you continue to I make? Don't. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am. I consider myself a very creative person still to this day like I create things but um not not an artist per se I think no, I understand yeah I think why I stopped that is because I just well it's not as sad as my sound but um I just thought that I didn't have what it takes to be an artist and I don't think what it takes to be an artist is talent I honestly think that like artists need so much drive and determination that no injury or financial strain or competition can steer them off their path you know um at the time I just I didn't have the courage to you know face that risk it's such a hard thing to be an artist and that's why I admire them so much mm. um quite yeah. a few of our students actually come from studio arts fine art you know uh, in an interview when I asked them are you going to carry on they say well yeah but you know I've realized that I'm never going to make a living out of this so the next best I guess is to do the MA in art business and sort of get involved in that art world and support uh, artists mm -hmm. whom they 
probably quite wrongly, I think, see as more talented. You know, I think people have opportunities and training and so on. Um, so um, so that, that brings us, I guess, onto the next thing about choice of educational subjects. Um, what steered you in the direction of art and maybe um, what you did your undergraduate degree in? I'll tell you. So my undergraduate degree was fine arts. I, I did art. Yes. Um, I started as an artist, but... Um, it's very funny because I always thought I loved making the art more than I love I liked looking at it. But then probably my first day at the undergrad, I just I had decided immediately that I'm going to go into our history masters because I loved everything about history, sociology, visual culture, all the theory behind why things are the way they are. I just I just found that so very attractive. Um and I just really wanted to know more. So, um, yeah, then I just, I, I chose to do the art history program because um, I did the art history program right after I in, uh, I interned for the Peggy Guggenheim Museum. And that was the first time in my entire life that I was introduced to the concept of collecting and collectors, mm. which is funny because, well, it's a word that I probably overuse today on a daily basis um I just didn't know anything about it I was never mm -hmm. exposed to it where I come from um and you know Peggy Graham was a collector and the museum is called Peggy Graham Collection not Peggy Graham mm -hmm. Museum true <laughs> and I just had to be you know kind of introduced to that and learn about it and you know the idea that she used to own all these things and she used mm -hmm. to buy these things and, mm -hmm. and knew all the artists often intimately as we yeah were. <laughs> exactly everything was just so it was a new world for me and I just I couldn't believe that I spent three years of my life in higher education and nobody ever told me something that was so common knowledge basic knowledge because I mean I guess exactly because of that um yeah and I just I just fell in love with the market I just fell in love with the idea that somebody can support artists so I don't have to give up my dream of being an artist because people can support that and the people can support that are the people make, who make up the market and by then I just decided that there's so much more that I need to learn mm -hmm. and therefore I just um I just decided to kind of really explore into all the different roles that are within the industry the art market industry um and yeah where that started I started with my history contemporary history classes and kind of learning where things are today, why they got there, how they got made, and yeah, everything in between these steps. So kind of moving from making art into then studying the art of other people and the art and the and the history of collecting. And obviously the not the background knowledge then therefore of art history, plus your experience at the Peggy Guggenheim collection <laughs> uh, and understanding her as a collector, um that pres that pre that must feed into your ability to be an art advisor. We'll come to that in a moment, but um, do you want to just tell us about your PhD subject and how you chose it and which how it's changed along the way? Yeah. Um, I love collectors. I love working with them. Um, I was working with collectors before I started my PhD mm -hmm. and I just there was something about the educational aspect that I just loved and I just really wanted to know more about them um they when you say collectors when you when you put people into any group um you kind of generalize you know and there were so many so many differences that yeah. I just really wanted to unpack and I just really wanted to understand like so I all of these people who are so different to each other collectors are there other names for them? Um, and I just really want to contribute, you know, in any way I could. Uh, and I feel like a PhD is a very long commitment. And anyone who's done one, anyone who's tried this journey, um, they know that, that it's a very long commitment. And at the end, you kind of contribute either theoretically or practically towards something. And I just really wanted that. Um, and, I, you know, at the beginning, I wasn't really sure exactly how I wanted to do it but I knew that I wanted to talk about wanted to research into people different roles um within the industry I was thinking about you know 
the different players that there are, the different courts that there are, um, if there are any other kind of sort of um, things that I can unpack. And then for me, it was always all about collectors and collecting as an activity. Um, and yeah, um, what it's about, it's, um, I've spent the last three to four years really looking into collectors, researching um, about, you know, there's also the theoretical parts of it that I might, I'm just not going to bore you with you and your uh, listeners, but no, I, I, think, you know, the, I think that would be interesting, the theoretical yeah. framework. Perfect. Um, I'm looking at it from kind of, I am following the journey of the object, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, but after it's been, I'm not looking at it when, during its making, during the exhibition, it's actually when it's collected. So I look at collectors as a, as somebody who explores the market and they take different steps. And these three different steps that they have is, you know, basically buying the art and then owning the art and then letting go. Um, uh, I, I think of that thing as kind of, um, of that theory is kind of a relationship. So the collector falls in love with the art. They start dating and then they decide to get married. That's when, you know, the ownership happens. Um, and then they either fall out of love or, you know, their marriage ends because the collector passed away. Um, and then I'm just looking at what happens to the art after that, just by following the object's journey and following the collector's journey, looking into the motivations, the intentions, because they're not always the same, um, what, why you intended to buy in the first place and why you wanted to, uh, what you intend to do with it is not always the same, the habits of the collector. Um, and yeah, just the theory behind that is just trying to understand how collectors construct the value of art. Mm -hmm. um, goes back to my ideas of what the driving forces are for people to do the things they do, especially collectors, why they collect, why would you, they own. Would, would you, for example, use the theories of people like Pierre Bourdieu in yeah. terms of what, yeah, the cultures? Yeah, of the, value, yeah the cultural capital um, um, is kind of the idea that you kind of incorporate into the value of art, seeing value from different perspectives. Um, my theoretical framework is um, materiality because I'm following the object I'm trying to understand the materiality of the object and how this changes in mm. the different you know when it's in a gallery or in an auction house or in an art studio mm. it's a commodity and yes. it's for sale and somebody can buy it but then that it's same, the same art, it's strange isn't it it's the same object and you see it in different object. contexts and it seems to change yeah it changes because there's and there's also like its value changes as well, whereas yeah. its value is to have a price tag attached to it, there's no longer for sale. It still has a kind of monetary value, which is, you know, either the insurance you pay with it or how much you spend, if you, that's important to you as a collector, mm -hmm. how much it's appraised for right now, how much you're going to spend and you're, you're going to make of it. Um, the social value is also there. There is kind of the the show off aspect or you know kind of gathering people so they can see the new home of the art and that might lead to kind of supporting the artist if more people would like to own that as well um there's so many different aspects um mm -hmm. of that object and then by selling it again you repurpose it you remake it into a commodity um so you could give this this identity back to it um and i just find that so attractive because as you say, it's exactly the same object. When did that change <laughs> happen? Like, when, who is when responsible? I, yeah, when I, so that, some listeners might be quite surprised by the first thing you said was about um, the analogy of a relationship, a human relationship of love and, you know, ending sometimes in, in, in divorce or letting go of something, maybe they die. It can be very sad. So it's all very quite emotional, that emotional presence in, in art. And I'm just thinking that one of the classic books that influenced my interest in collecting uh, academically uh, was was Jeff Elsner's um, The Cultures of Collecting, which I'm sure you know. Uh, there's an essay in there by Baudrillard, 
sort of French philosophical kind of writer. Um, and he he talks exactly about that. He talks about the object, the collectors collect because of the passion. And of course, passion is still a word we even use in when we're looking at the art market, uh, you know, um, and even at investment, we talk about investments of passion. Uh, so, um, you know, high net worth individuals and ultra high net worth individuals. I've just been doing a report, actually, which is a little bit confidential at the moment. It's going to be launched next week, um, but it's part of a part of a report of several authors about um, about what's happened to the art market recently. And, and increasingly, I find when I look at wealth reports that people, millennials, younger generations are beginning to say they, they want to buy luxury objects and fine art in particular, more so than other luxury objects because they're passionate about them. And that, I think there's been a bit of a sea change there to a certain extent, or has there, you know, I think there's been so much about people investing in art simply for its financial value. I think what I'm getting, what is coming across is that millennials are, are wanting to go back to, I actually care about what I'm buying. You know, I want a relationship with it, if you like. Yeah, you know, um, I think it's because there is, you know, the audience change as well in the artist demographic. There's so mm -hmm. much, um, so many younger artists actually now having their moment and- Yeah, and, and, and so artists well. of color. Yeah, and they're doing so well. And I think that's exactly why, like you, you really do want to be part of that. If the mm. people who are involved in, the, in the, you want to be involved in the market, if the people involved in the mm. industry are your age, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and also, um. I think it's a very bad idea to just do it for investment because mm. even like people who are very serious collectors, extremely successful in their collection, they very rarely do it for the money because they know that this is not going to make you a collector. Like you, you actually need to own the world, the work, not just to buy and sell it. Yes. In order to be a collector, you have to have this middle kind of, um, this period in the middle that, it's you living with the object. And mm -hmm. yeah, about the first thing you said about loving the object and the analogy of like a, a romantic relationship. I had this discussion recently with somebody who asked me as an ad advisor, is that how you see it? <laughs> well, yeah, if I've talked to so many collectors and they all say, or most of them say, I love art or I fell in love with it. Or yes. if you love it, then, you know, that that's exactly it. It's, it's but... a romantic love. That surprises people as well. Um, you know, if when you when you when when great contemporary art collectors are are interviewed, people like obviously Charles Saatchi, um, I'm thinking of um um oh goodness, um um Patricia Sandretto, you know, work, working working in Italy at, in her foundation in Torino. Um, and um, we always take our students to her foundation. She always talks to us. And it's all about, you know, I, I came to London from Italy as a student in the late 80s, early 90s. And my, my you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky to come from a, a wealthy background, but I love art. We're art collectors. And luckily, there were these people that later became labelled as the YBAs, the Young British Artists. And I was collecting early Damien Hurst. But most importantly for her was that she was collecting the women artists she felt that they were underrepresented and, you know, at a very early stage. But but she, she like Saatchi, like Pino, they say, I only ever buy what I love, which is why I don't, I very rarely buy at auction, they will say. You know, so I want to also be quite philanthropic. I see myself as supporting emerging artists, such as what people like Hearst and Rachel White Rees and, and so on used to be. Um, and and I'm always I think it always surprises people that these big names like Saatchi and so on that they almost see as like villains in the media. You know, they're wealthy people who have too much money, and they you know uh, that it quite surprises people that how passionate these people are, are about the art that they um, that they collect. They collect, yeah, that's, mm. that's true, very true. Yeah, and if you know, they tend to say that I'm not really in this for the money, but if if the work goes up in value, that's a bonus but a lot of a lot of the works i'm collecting go down in value so it's almost like a hedge portfolio in financial terms that i know that a lot of the contemporary artists that i buy i probably will never be able to resell so that yeah. so the financial value at least temporarily will become zero but we have to watch that obviously because 
you know, your understanding of the history art will know that some forgot some artists who were never bought in their lifetime, thinking Vincent, um, you know, end up selling for millions. So we can never be certain. We're not the people who decide what has that financial value in the future. We we know about it now, but we never know what's going to happen in the future. I think that's another fascinating thing about art as an investment asset, because obviously when you're looking at gold and oil and other hard assets like that, they're very different from art because art is unique. It's yeah. a hedonic asset, yeah, it's a pleasure you. asset. Uh, so it is very, very different, I think. Um, yeah. just we, we were obviously continue to talk about that, but I was just going to ask, um, uh, I think people would be interested in, when did you first have the idea of becoming an art advisor? How did that, can you remember how that actually happened? Did you did you think that you wanted to be an art advisor or did it just develop organically? Um, I think somebody suggested it to me. I used to work for commercial galleries and I did that for um, a long time, but then I just, for many reasons that I, I you know, there is many things that are, Obviously, a, a dealer and an advisor, they're both intermediaries, but there's many dif differences uh, between the two. And for all these differences, I just felt that that was not for me. It wasn't really aligning with what I wanted to do in my um, ethics uh, and my preference, let's say. Um, so somebody suggested, one of my collectors suggested it. Um, and I just it just made so much sense at the time. It was like addressing the elf in the room. Um, it was like oh yeah you're right like that's that's what I should do I just mm. I was always so fascinated by the idea of education and there were so many collectors who they aren't shy to ask for advice you know it's not that they don't want to they really want to they just don't know who to ask and where to find these people mm. and I just feel that advisors are these people so I just really mm. wanted to to contribute from an educational pedagogy perspective yeah. i think i think people can feel a little bit ashamed that you know i've got i've got money i've got disposable income and i love to buy art that's great there's nothing wrong with that and they're supporting artists who really need the support um and but they 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 feel quite ashamed that they say oh, i never had time i'm so busy kind of working to make money that i don't have time to get them develop the knowledge and therefore it's quite reasonable in it you know this goes back historically to Cicero and his art agent Atticus, where um, the ancient Roman, you know, uh, wealthy politician Cicero in the first century BCE, we have got his letters to Atticus, who's based in Athens, and, and Atticus is basically acting as his art advisor, and, and Cicero is quite unashamedly saying, you're the one, I rely on your good taste, because I don't have the time for that, but I love art, and I love what you buy me, and it's site-specific. You you put things into different villas, into different parts of my villas that speak to the location. Um, and so it's there 2,000 years ago already, that relationship between the art advisor, and it's an intimate relationship, as it is, I think, with the artists as well. So as you, think, you know... I think it's a great relationship. It's like, it's a friendship almost. Obviously, there's the business aspect of it. You're a business partner, but at the same time, you're you're a friend for the collection. Um, yes. And I honestly think there is nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, if if we were able to learn everything overnight, then we would. I mean, I would just build my Spotify platform and not need to, there would be no need for me to spend money on everything they spend money on, you know? I mean, there's, I will make my art. I will make my own you know, see Tombly um, painting, I, I cannot do that. Like if you've managed to, you know, kind of commit time and if you managed to learn something that other people haven't, then that's what you capitalize on. But that's that's capitalist society. That's, that's It's normal and it's perfectly normal. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone should ever be ashamed to ask for advice, consultancy, mm -hmm. pretty much everything that you need and other people have you don't need to develop like if no. it's especially if it's hard to be developed you know if it's our yeah. historia like our historical knowledge yes so am i right in saying that you didn't ever work for an art advisory company which are out there and i know some of my students decide to cut their teeth by working for an art advisory company that has a lot of employees with each of whom is an art advisor and they're given clients um, am I right in saying that you didn't follow that model, that you started just maybe with some people that you knew maybe from the galleries you'd worked in, which I think is quite a typical way of starting as a 
as your own dealer sometimes, but you're as an art advisor. Is that the way that works? And then it grows through people then recommending you personal recommendations. That's that's exactly how it happened. I never worked for an ad advisory, um, like a big firm, advisory firm. Um, I looked into them obviously before I decided on like my you know specific um, kind of list of services, what I can offer, what my specialization is, what my what I'm good at. Um, I had to look and in, into you know other people, um, what they do, and I did that. But I I didn't come from that background. Background was exactly as you said was through networking, people who knew my work as, you know, working for an art dealer and for a gallery. Um, and then that was then word of mouth, kind of some marketing. And that was pretty much how, how it happens. Mm -hmm. Did you ever write a business plan or didn't you I need did. to do, you did write a business? Was that kind of for yourself or were you aiming to get some capital investment in what you were doing? Um. No, it was literally just for myself. Yeah, so you're sort of you, accountable. You're self funding from your other income. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it also kind of included kind of like, mm. you know, company business call goals, like, you know, both in terms of like numbers as in clients, but also, yeah. um, you know, the art that we'll be buying and the money that I can generate. So it, it's also kind of to keep me accountable and to make mm. sure that I don't you know, forget why I started and where I'm leading with that. Yeah, that's that's good. And um, what, obviously you don't want to mention any names, but could you give the listeners some idea of your of your clients, if I can call them that, the collectors, um, in terms of demographics, like maybe, maybe kind of typical ages, gender, um, nationalities, national backgrounds, you know, are they, are, is there a variety or is there a kind of pattern in, in, in your clients? No, my clients really vary, to be honest. I mean, I've had the um had the blessing to work for a gallery that had um a client list that was, you know, all over the place. Mm. So even if I didn't get these people to be my clients, because I obviously I wouldn't do that. Um, but some people kind of recommended me. Um, and then with all the other other things that I was doing within the market, um, people would just like hear about this um activity this business so they would just reach out but there is no there's no set there's nothing to combine them like and to, mm. to kind of put them together if that makes sense mm. i've got young mm. collectors and i've also got uh, a bit more senior a bit more older um i've got people from different parts of europe but also you know outside europe but in terms of like who i'm kind of targeting right now i i i really try to kind of focus more on younger collectors mm -hmm. 30s early 40s mm -hmm. because I so really like millennial ge millennial generation yeah yeah i really and, think and do they they're... may i ask do they tend to be what we might call hnwis high net worth individuals i.e with disposable income of a million dollars plus i think that's usually defined as at the moment or or isn't or don't you really know I mean, you mean yeah. collect millennial the, collecting the people general, that your clients? Your your clients, <laughs> you know, do you know anything about where about their financial? Yeah, the, the the people that I advise are probably in that category. Probably H and W S. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's nothing surprising about that. I'd expect, I'd expect. Yeah, I'd, yeah, no, but but it doesn't it doesn't mean that this is how collectors collect. Like you know, no, you can no, have no. collectors who start very modest numbers um and they can build their net worth um doing what they're doing as collectors you know yes. um, yeah. it's not it's not about the investment of it is that yes. you might you don't have to resell it to make the money you can just mm -hmm. own it and then mm -hmm. the art can increase in value based on different factors mm -hmm. you can build your net worth doing that yeah. um and there is many people who just don't want to spend that much either because they can't afford it they just don't they just don't want it they, they're, mm. they're new to that and they're not sure yeah um it's not that i specifically will target older and high net worth individuals um the ideal client is you know has nothing to do with how much money they have to dispose or to mm -hmm. spend the ideal client for me at least is somebody who's 
open to education. I mean, they want to learn. They they want you to, you know, to take your advice. Mm-hmm. Um, I myself, I'm a very critical mind, and I tend to question pretty much everything, um, mm-hmm. which is something I assume that my students hate about me. Mm-hmm. Um, um, well, I, it's I, so I, good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what um, educate means drawing out by quest getting students to question their values etc so there's no no problem with that i I actually think that by questioning everything you say you end up making better use of the words you use and the thoughts you have and understanding it better Mm -hmm. um and if it changes to what you thought it was great you've got to clear Mm -hmm. my mind if not then great you found why like you backed it up in a great way Mm -hmm. but now it's a lot stronger than it was before I actually did that interrogation to you, you know? Um, and I actually really like when collectors kind of allow me to do that. Um, yeah. And like when collectors allow me to, you know, um, I don't think of the knowledge I have about artists, that it's an accumulated knowledge um, based on market research, based on my studies, uh, based on you know the networking that I have and things I I hear and the place I've been, art fairs, gallery shows, whatever. I don't think that this is kind of set in stone. I think that this is where you start, and then if you allow me to impart some of this knowledge, perfect. You're not gonna learn it because that's not the purpose of that. I'm not gonna give an exam then um, and ask you who exhibited where, who bought it, and how much I was and when does it change that's not the important part the important part is like do you like it are you going to keep it why do you like it if you like it um what do you think about it and maybe just kind of some comparative evaluation based on the other things that you've learned it's really important to like see as much as you can read as much as you can not necessarily learn them word by word but understand them in your own in your own way and i think that's what collectors should do Mm-hmm. And that's why I try to say no as much as I can to collectors who come with the idea that I have X amount of money. How can I make more or mm-hmm. how can I spend it mm-hmm. and make my house pretty? Because mm-hmm. that's not that's not my job. That's probably a consultancy thing. That's probably yes. an interior designer's work, which yes. is a beautiful thing to do. It's just not my Mm. you're looking at the kind of you're you're hoping you're looking at the philosophical collections between individual art objects as a collection rather as opposed to what they look like in the different rooms of a house although that might overlap with that um it can overlap it's not like the curatorial part of it is part of advising Mm -hmm. um i don't rule that out but it's not it's you know, the, you can curate, curate the collection based mm. on what's already there. That's one avenue. You can also curate a collection based on what is in the environment, what colors mm-hmm. are in the room, what the furniture yes. is, or where it's going. That's another part of curating. Mm-hmm. They're both equally equally sure. important. And they're both part of like curating as an advisor. I'm not ruling them out. What I am ruling out, are, you know, is that category that, you know, doesn't come with a budget, but says, let's spend this on something that's going to look nice, but I don't mm-hmm. want to learn anything about this great, greater grand tree that is the art world. Mm-hmm. Because it is, and you're just like a little seed that mm-hmm. contributed to that tree becoming bigger and bigger. You're just a tiny little leaf. If you don't want to acknowledge the tree, then you, you probably don't belong in the market. You're just a buyer. How um, interesting. That's how so I see, see that. it as a kind of positive cultural growth that is contributing to that overall art world, which includes private collections, public collections, the historical objects, etc. That's how I see it. And I think that to that mindset contributes the idea of private collections because yes. all the private collectors well, the ones I work with, but also the ones that I, um, I've interviewed, the ones I've talked to during my internship, the ones I worked with in the past um, when I was working for an art dealer, they, they do have this idea that things are temporary. Yes, I accumulate works now, but what's going to happen next? And there's many individuals who actually want to either donate the works or mm. have the works in like 
private museums of their yes. own or just relinquish the words bef before it's not too late, you know, mm -hmm. just, just sell them all. Yeah. Um, but there is this idea that, you know, the work is going to be there with or without me. Mm -hmm. So I might as well just understand that <laughs> I'm not, I'm not an authority just because I'm a collector, just because I buy it and I add value to it and I get to see it. I am lucky. I'm not an authority. I'm mm. not an agent. And, and, and in a sense, the art will outlive me. Um, I'm a exactly. guardian of that art and a temporary owner. Um, you know, we've seen quite recently, actually, in the art market um, during the pandemic in particular, I think we saw a lot of single owner collections coming up at auction. And um, I think those single owners are genuinely, and obviously the auction houses market it like this, but I think they, many of them are genuinely people who have a really good eye for art or may, maybe combined with a good art advisor like yourself, you know, but it's a kind of, they're very proud of their collection. But I remember the Durkheim collection selling in the early millennium. And, and the big point about that is that he was selling all these works he bought from German post-war artists when they were unknown um basilets and people like that and polka um and and suddenly they become really well known and they were worth an awful lot of money but the collector said i'm going to sell all this and i'm going to start again with other unknown german artists and i thought that that was a great example of how a collector might be seen to be working commercially on on investment value but actually what they're doing is saying right i've had enough of this this can now go into other people's collections i'm going to start again with with younger group of artists i think charles sarchi did that to a certain extent once he got a bit overwhelmed by the ybas and they were already out there he then goes to manhattan and tries to find some artists under 30 who are who, whom he can also support and i think he did it in india and so on uh, so that that is one curating. aspect, I think, of the collector. I think that's a matter of curating. It allows mm. you to, you know, kind of repurpose everything and mm. start again, as you say. And you know, I think I think that's that's why. Um, I think it's Sigmund Freud who said that a collection to which you have there is nothing to be added to and nothing to be removed from. It's it's just that. So yeah. there's no purpose to it. Yeah. Um, I had similar conversation just yesterday with a private collector friend of mine who um, we're just talking about, you know, how private collections end up basically. And I was just, I, I have this idea. Um, so Eli Broad, like, you know, the, the amazing collector, one of the most serious collectors ever, one of the most important people to ever sit on board of directors and trustees of museums. And then, um, thinking about his art estate management, he created this, um, there was like this creation of like this amazing um, kind of private collection museum that is a great contribution to LA, but at the same time, it's, it kind of outlives you. Mm -hmm. Your name is there. It's mm -hmm. the name of your collection. But it, it becomes, and that's my opinion, it's obviously, I'm not quoting anyone, it, it kind of becomes a mausoleum, you know, like, you because you stop leaving it yeah. stops leaving. yeah um, I agree with that. which is i think why there's so many individual collectors going to the auction now um because they see what happens how uh, like the succession of these private collections um it's never going to be the same if mm -hmm. you have people if you're lucky enough to have people that you trust um that they're going to continue collecting that's amazing because the collection is going to have life, but it's never going to be your collection anymore. It's mm -hmm. not going to be the things that you chose. It's not going to be the, the things that talk about your time. It's not the mm -hmm. art of your time, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And if you just leave it there to kind of commemorate the collector, it stops living. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's not a gallery. It's not a museum. It's not a collection. It's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, yeah, there is no... And I think that's... There is an increasing number of collectors who consider their options. If that's start donating works, that might be a thing. The problem with that is that museums might not accept all these donations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it can be partly donations. It can be resales. And I think the easiest and fastest way is to go through an auction because it's it's one sale. Um, if the collection is big, you can do two, three. Um, and I think that's why that happens.
which is very different to what used to happen. There is this book, Breakfast at Sotheby's, which I'm sure all of you know the listeners know. Um, and it had listed, um, when I first read that, it listed like why people sell works. Um, and it was the three Ds and it was death, debt, and divorce. And mm-hmm. then it was the fourth D added, which was dealing. Mm-hmm. And now it just feels like none of these four Ds appeal about to, to any of the collectors. They just have the works and they just don't know. The reason why they sell them is not because they're dealing. It's not because they, they've they died and somebody mm-hmm. died and they ended up with it. It's just because they know that the, the art needs to outlive them. It's going to outlive them, whether they like it or not. And it just needs to get out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's another source for auction houses. Well, coming to sources, Michaela, um, do you source works for your clients from lots of different um, sources? So art fair, do you source them from auctions sometimes, from art fairs, from galleries, from ever from art colleges? I don't know if you want to talk about where you... And, and also at the same time, maybe you could talk about what kind of art, um, you know, very briefly, obviously, um, but, but yeah. are, are you only looking at like, contemporary post-war art or, or are you sometimes advising people or do you have clients who are interested in old masters antiquities cr- cross collecting which is a big thing obviously at the moment could you talk about sources and types of art yeah sources is pretty much every marketplace that there mm-hmm. is um the benefit of being an art advisor um, is that you have no agenda you have no portfolio so you there's you know, you all know gallery dealer, artist, anything, they all you nothing, um, uh, which is a great position to be in. Um, so basically how I source the works is, you know, it can be from artists, um, profiles online, you find them out, you it can be from kind of art fairs, auctions, we've bought works at auctions um, on a number of occasions. Um, I've also tried to you know, art fairs I avoid, but sometimes, um, sometimes there's good art there, and you can't turn a blind eye to it. You know, you just you just have to, um, to get it from the art fair. Then you know, just try and see the inventory of the of the gallery. Um, and um, yeah, galleries. Obviously, I love galleries. Um, mm-hmm. I love going to galleries. You, you just learn so much. Uh, not just from the for the artists you want, but for all the other artists who they're trying to, um, you know, show you and present to you. Um, and then, yeah, the art that I, um, well, my collectors are contemporary art collectors that okay. um, I have had in the past um, advised on uh, uh, impressionist artists, okay. um, French impressionism, mm-hmm. um, which is, Funny because that collector also um, was involved with NFTs, which is very new thing. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that kind yeah. of reflects what the market is suggesting over recent years. It's impressionist, modern, post-war, contemporary. Do you do you ever are you into do you any of your clients are they interested in like very ultra contemporary art as we now call it, like very emerging contemporary artists, particularly the women artists and the artists of color, black artists. Um, not necessarily my collectors, but I know okay. that it's very, um, yeah. it happens. And I know that museums really want to be involved in that as well, because mm-hmm. it's important to be as inclusive and diverse as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And and what happened to you in the pandemic as an art advisor? Did life carry on? Did business carry on? It did. Um, mm-hmm. Nothing has changed, really, because, yeah. you know, you don't have to physically be there um sure. and the good thing is that if you want to see the art um then you just end up not buying art that you haven't seen before um, yeah, so you but, were looking at online viewing rooms at galleries during the pandemic with your clients you know i know that many people do that but i really like to see the work because mm. i know my clients want so yeah. my clients will cast my eyes yes um I am. I 100% want to see the words. Yeah. Uh, the words before um, before a purchase takes place. But um, did you did you therefore stop during the long lockdowns? No, I, uh, no. Um, when I say the work, I just mean like probably the artist do. So if I know the artist and I've seen some works of the artist, then I yeah. know I can I can imagine how the work looks yes. like because I've seen 
other works of the artist so i know how they work um but yeah that's it hasn't really no and um maybe maybe winding up now um i'm aware of the time um so do you have any do you have a, an interesting anecdote some kind of story i'm sure you've got lots of stories and obviously it's confidential material but do you have any interesting particularly stories that stick in your mind about while you've been doing art advisory that are kind of the most the most interesting ones are the confidential ones they are <laughs> okay. they're, they're, um but yeah i mean I, I honestly can't share anything, but just mm. very, very briefly, there's many things involving art law that people should be very worried about. Yes. <laughs> you, can, you can find yourself in very tricky situations okay. um, if you are not 100% um, sure about what you're doing, what the people who work with you are doing, and if they know that what they're doing is you know probably gonna create some problems um yeah i'm just gonna okay no i get but hence i guess the reason why we teach quite a lot of art law and yeah. they have an examination on art law our students it's the only examination we do but hence the reason that we do that uh so michaela melakuri thank you very much for being a guest on the art business podcast today and um maybe we'll see you again in the future and we're the, 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 down the line a bit be interested to see how you're getting on at another date but thank you very much for being the guest today Thank you, thank you for having me, David. That was very interesting.